It's interesting when we look at the Soviet Union, and maybe you have understood this, but the Soviet Union was kind of the leader in legalizing and practicing abortion on a wholesale level. As a matter of fact, it was some Russian medical uh, officials who developed the, uh, that method of abortion used in early, early weeks. And uh, what is it? Uh, what is that called, that early method of abortion? I forget. Yeah, it's uh, anyway, they were the ones who developed that, and they were the masters of, uh, of the practice of abortion. And abortion for them became a very useful tool because as they socialized, as they collectivized the country, they moved people away from individual houses and or apartments and moved them into these huge apartment complexes. And uh, I've been in those many times, stayed in them often, and they are small. And if you take a, a room probably a whole apartment might be six, seven hundred square feet or even less. Put two or three families in there and imagine what happens when mama is with child and then the other mama is with child. How are they going to live? So even the social conditions in that country contributed to the, uh, the immense number of divorce, uh, d abortions that they that they uh, developed in that country. And it was uh, mentally and spiritually justified. And here's what happened. They removed God completely. And with, without God, who gives the stamp of approval, the stamp of sacredness to the life of an unborn child? The, the uh, materialistic society certainly isn't going to do it. Because of their materialistic worldview, a child was often interference in the plans. Why? Well, look at these ladies sitting right up here, front row. They would have had to work in factories or on farms. You could find collective farms where there would be ladies out there with their babushka, as they call them. Actually, the word babushka, we call it that hanky, that, that kerchief that women often wear. Well, babushka means grandmother in Russian. But there they were with their red bandanas on their heads, out doing all of the farm work along with the men. So a farm that, for example, maybe some of you have, maybe you, it's a family farm. And you have just your family and harvest time, seeding time. Maybe you hire somebody, one or two people. But on that same farm, under the collective system, the collectivization, they might have 150, 200 people milking the cows, feeding the cows, making hay, and all of those kinds of things. So the farm, collective farm system, simply didn't work. It was non-productive. And so people were pulled into that. And therefore, oftentimes, a child became uh, an unwanted interruption in their work schedule, the government-appointed work schedule. I don't think it was just that the mothers wanted to do that, but they were forced. Their economic, uh, whole economic system encouraged that kind of development. So this began with, of course, one of the leaders of this movement, who was it? Who? Man by the name of Vladimir Ilyich Ulyanov. Who was that? You all know the name. Lenin. That was Lenin's real name. Lenin was born and raised in the city of Ulyanovsk, named after him. Before Lenin came along, that city was called Simbirsk. It's a nice city on the banks of the Volga River in Russia. But because that was Lenin's hometown, it was named after him. Again, his real name is Ulyanov. So that's why the city is named what? 
Ulyanovsk. And uh, the whole town bears the stamp of, of Vladimir Ilyich Ulyanov. Interestingly, about a third of a mile from a big park overlooking the Volga River, uh, a big park named after Lenin, there is a church. What church do you suppose that is? The Lutheran Church. Established there by German immigrants. And uh, as you may know, there were one or two people who come out of the German-Russian settlement in this country who understood this, but there were actually tens of thousands of Germans who had immigrated to Russia, and uh, over the years they developed large settlements, farm, they were great in agriculture, hard-working, industrious, wherever they came they would build a, they would build a village, a school, and a church, always school and church, right in the center of the village. And that you still see today. And so the towns were along the Volga River, many of them were inhabited by these Germans, most of whom were Lutherans. So uh, Vladimir Ilyich Ulyanov's mother was one of these German immigrants, a German Lutheran immigrant. And I've never seen any written proof of this, but the people there tell me, not, more, not just once, but they tell me that Lenin was baptized in that Lutheran church in uh, Ulyanovsk, there in, in that city. And I preach and teach in that church regularly, and I don't consider that any kind of a claim to fame. It's probably a claim to shame more than anything else. That we, and we have visited Lenin's home over there. That home was, was huge. Lenin's parents were quite wealthy people. His father was a education or school inspector who would travel around inspecting schools and so on and so forth. And uh, one of his brothers was, was uh, executed for some kind of a treasonous act, and I think that helped turn Lenin against the, uh, against the government. And of course, he became one of the pioneers of the whole communist movement. And uh, people are still, still suffering from that yet today. Now, uh, abortion was, as I said earlier, was practiced very heavily among the communists because if you remove the biblical ethic, the biblical teaching about the sanctity of life, then what's the problem with abortion? You know, we are sensitive because we understand the biblical teaching of the sanctity of life. Although even medically they should have understood the difference, but they didn't. And so uh, the communism became a very fruitful ground for that. And as I was thinking about it, I looked in the Old Testament, and as a matter of fact, if you're a pastor, I would encourage you to do a study of child sacrifice in the Old Testament. I had gone through four years of Concordia College, where we had some Bible courses, then four years of seminary, and I don't think once it ever was ever drawn to anybody's attention this whole concept of child sacrifice. But just uh, quickly, uh, though the Jews believed in God, Yahweh, when they moved in with, into the villages and towns and countryside occupied by the Canaanites, who did the Canaanites believe? Who did they follow? Baal or Baal and Asherah, a female deity. Baal and Asherah encouraged child sacrifice. So we look, for example, in 2 Kings 16.3, are told that Ahaz, the king of Judah, walked in a way of the kings of Israel and made his sons pass through the fire. What does it mean to make your son pass through the fire? It means you throw them into a fiery furnace as sacrifice. Or 
during the time Hosea, king of Israel, did evil in the sight of the Lord. Though the Lord warned them by the prophets, they'd made Asherah and served the Baal. And they made their sons pass through the fire. And subsequently, 2 Kings 21, Manasseh, son of the godly king Hezekiah, made his sons, what? Pass through the fire. Child sacrifice. So eliminating God, or where God was no longer the focus of worship and obedience, child sacrifice crept in very quickly. And what do we see in our culture today? What do we see here in America where we ought to know better? But as God is being pushed farther and farther to the periphery, what comes in to that? Abortion. What is abortion? Child sacrifice, the same thing. The only difference is the time. In those days, the child was already born. But now it happens before the child was born. But the effect on the child is still exactly the same. And the effect on the human heart is still the same. So uh, let me point to a couple of uh, experiences. Several years ago, I was invited to go to the city of Novosibirsk. Now, Moscow has been the capital of Russia for many years. But I don't know if you remember this, but when the Nazi, the German army, invaded, they were within, I think it was about 40 miles of Moscow. So the Russian government feared that the city would be overrun. So they had a second capital already planned. Where was that? Novosibirsk, way out in the state or the province of Siberia. And uh, I was in the city of Novosibirsk. There was a young pastor there by the name of Sevalod Litkin. By the way, he had studied in the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod Seminary in Fort Wayne. So he was very familiar with us. And we were having a meeting in a house, a little house. That was their headquarters. They didn't have much at that time. That was their headquarters. And uh, I remember in that meeting, probably the one thing I do remember, is this lady who had come from the city of Abakan 19 hours by train. And I remember she said she vacillated. Should I, shouldn't I go? It's a long way, it's expensive, and maybe I won't go. But then at the last hour, she decided she would go to the city of Novosibirsk, New Siberia, in, uh, for this little conference, Lutherans for Life conference. And actually, it wasn't just Lutherans for Life. It was a kind of a little church conference. And I spoke, and after the talk, she came up to me and said, Pastor, I need to talk with you. And then somebody else came, and then another person. And so I couldn't talk. And then same thing happened again. Same thing a third time. Somebody always interrupted, and I couldn't talk. Here it came to the end. I still remember very clearly that time. And she came up, and I don't recall, but she probably grabbed me by the sleeve. Pastor, I need to talk with you now. I was finally getting the message. And so I took her and got an interpreter. We went into a little room, no bigger than, smaller than one of these tables. And she said, Pastor, I need to confess. I've had, I don't know, it was five, six, seven abortions. And I feel terrible. She was overwhelmed with guilt from those abortions. What can I do? Well, I could tell her, well, you should have known better. You know, that was your own child. Or how could you be so stupid, you know, that nobody would kill their own child? But no, what good does that do? It doesn't do anybody any good. She knew all of that. She needed a message, a gospel message. And so I explained, and then I read Bible verses. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses from all sin. If we confess our sin, 
He is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What does that mean? Forgive us, cleanse us. The blood of Christ cleanses. And I explained to her, and I said, I don't remember her name, but I said, would you like this kind of forgiveness? And she said, yes. And I explained, right here now with this interpreter and myself, you can pray, Jesus, I confess my sin. And I explained to her, when you confess, it's not just that I made a mistake, it's what, that I did what? What was the mistake? I killed my babies. You have to confess truth. And she said that, weeping, terrified by what she had done. Dear Jesus, I confess that I killed my own babies. Please forgive me. And after she was done, I looked her in the eye and I said, I want you to know the blood of Christ does cleanse from all sin. That sin is forgiven. And she accepted that. And then I said, now can you look me in the eye and tell me that by the blood of Jesus Christ that sin of abortion is forgiven. And she did. She looked right in my eye and said, I believe that by the blood of Jesus I am forgiven. And you know what happened? She went home and I knew I'd probably never see her again but a few weeks later, two, three, four, I don't remember how long it was, I get a letter from her and she said, you know, Pastor, I went back to Abba Khan and I found two other women who were going to have abortions. And I explained what happened and they also decided not to have an abortion. And then, I don't know, several weeks, maybe six months later, I get another letter from her in Russian. And here she had written a poem on paper about this big, and it was a poem explaining how she had found forgiveness and cleansing through Jesus. The whole, it was a beautiful thing. And uh, so what can we say? That, that is really the fruit of, of forgiveness that Jesus can give. Now, I wished I could have gone back and met with her a week later to kind of reinforce what we had learned. But I do know that she had a, a Bible preaching pastor in her little church in Abakan, so she would get that kind of reinforcement. As a sideline, after we were done with that conference, I was heading, I was leaving the city of Novosibirsk, got out to the airport, standing in line, I was the last in line, and here comes this official. He taps me and says, and I couldn't understand, I didn't understand much Russian at all, and he said, I want you, and finally he got through, come with me. And I began to think, I bet I know what's wrong. And they got an old truck, they backed it up to the cargo door on the airplane. I had to climb up into the truck, and here they brought my suitcase. And they opened it up, and here were several of these little rubber models of babies, starting real small and into like a, I don't know, probably three, four months old baby. And they thought I was transporting Babies, dead babies. And you know those because we got those into Riga. Yeah. And so those are some of the things that happen. But you see, though we stand against the reality of abortion, uh, when it happens, and it does and will, we are there with the message of the cross of Jesus. And uh, that is... That is a wonderful thing because what else could you tell a woman 
who's had a number of abortions like that. What else could you tell her? Oh, it didn't make any difference. That wasn't a real person or this or that. How far would that go? Go here and out there. By the time she left, the guilt would be eating at her soul again. There's only one thing. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses from about all sin. Another time I was, and you guys will remember this one, in Saldus, Latvia. And by the way, Matins and Gunti Irbis were missionaries there. And when I'd come to Latvia, we'd work together. And here we were at this Bible school. And after one or two classes, they had made arrangements to go to this public school where we would give a, a message about pro-life. And we were standing there and we gave the message and pretty soon we all filed out and there were about, what was it, five or six students from the Bible school who went with us into that school. And as we were filing out, I noticed that one of these Bible school students, she was about 25 years old. I don't know if you remember her or not. I don't remember her name. But anyway, she was weeping quite strongly. And I kind of thought to myself, I probably know what the problem is. So I went up to her and said, would you like to talk? And all the rest went by, and there was a little kind of almost like a closet, half the size of these tables. And we got in there. And here again, weeping, she confessed. She had had, I don't remember, three or four different abortions. A young woman. I think she was 24, 25 years old. Again, what do you do? The same thing. You invite them to trust Jesus. Who was Jesus? And she had been hearing this in class. She knew that Jesus was the Savior, the Redeemer, who came to forgive sin. And so I pointed that out to her. And it was my custom to have them look me in the eye and to confess. I didn't just make a little mistake. I killed my own babies. And she did that and confessed it. And I could look her in the eye in the same way and tell her the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. And that is the power we have in the gospel of Jesus. And I don't know of, you can go to any number of psychologists or counselors or therapists or whatever you want to call them, but unless they are Christians who hold to the cross of Jesus, what remedy do they have? Sure, it helps people to externalize it, to speak about it, talk about it. You feel better for about how long you talked about it. Probably until you get out to the car, to the bus, or whatever it is. Then it's back again. It is only confessing to Jesus that, it, uh, that there can be final relief. And again, I wish I would have had an ability to go back and follow up with her and to confirm, to reaffirm the reality of forgiveness. And... Uh, there's another time, actually this was uh, last year. And I was in the preaching and teaching in the city of Saratov where this German, German Lutheran pastor was. He and I have become very good friends. And actually he has traveled with me here in this country where we were going around to several different congregations inviting them to contribute to a church they're building in, uh, in Saratov there in Russia. The, the Germans had a huge church, but the communists tore it down, so they had to start all over in a different location building a church. And they're making good progress. And so we traveled together for two and a half weeks where uh, I would invite and he would come and speak and talk about the church. And some congregations did very well in making contributions. But anyway, uh, I was in his church, not as he has a congregation in a village called Lipovka. Used to be a German village. 
They used to have a church there. But now the church was gone. Somebody had given them a house, and they would meet in that house and been there with them several times. Finally, we decided to have a kind of an evangelism emphasis in their town of Lipovka. And the only place big enough to meet was the communist uh, cultural center. And so there we were in the communist cultural center. And the first night, there were about eight or nine boys out there just kind of playing and laughing. But the second night, because we had a guy there who could play guitar, a Brazilian guy, as a matter of fact, who could play guitar, and they wanted to sing with the guitar. So the second night they came in, and they actually sat through the service so they could be there at the end and sing with him playing guitar. But as the service came closer to the end, I noticed this lady sitting, no, right over here. And she was crying. And she was a leader of the congregation, a very bright lady. And I had heard the story that she had gone to a church and somebody preached the gospel and she said, Jesus, I accept you. And then when she got home, she had one cow, one Holstein cow. As a matter of fact, the last time I was there, I went to the barn and saw her milk the cow. It was a great big barn, but pretty lonely for the cow. And uh, she told the story that when she came to the Lord, she went, and as she was milking the cow, she was articulating, speaking, what had happened. God, I have accepted Jesus. And Jesus, thank you for your love and thank you for your forgiveness. And here, in her earlier years, she had told me her husband was an alcoholic. And life was very difficult. Oh, they had a, quite a nice house there. I don't know how they arranged that, but they did. And she... Uh, Somehow, this alcoholic husband, before he died, she conceived a child, because she'd had many abortions prior to that. But she conceived this child. And she was so grateful to God for that child before that husband had gone. Here, the child was now about six or seven years old. And we used to eat together. He would come and sit with us and a very joyful, nice young boy. And then I got word that he had become ill with some probably a pulmonary disease. And they called the ambulance. And the ambulance driver was totally callous toward her needs. They loaded up the child. Instead of going straight to the city, which is about at least 40 miles away on an unbelievably terrible road, instead of going to the city with that boy, they had to make two or three other stops. So by the time they got there, he was dead. And I felt so badly for her because here she finally had a family. And it, I had to talk with her about forgiving this ambulance driver who was so terribly reckless, reckless and insensitive. So, uh, but those are some of the realities of, uh, of life in, in Russia. To kill or to keep is kind of the name. Well, it was certainly easier for them to kill their babies than to keep them. We used to do what we call language camps. And uh, we, for 19 years, we'd send a team into the school number one in the city of Petrozavodsk, Russia, which is northeast of St. Petersburg, probably close to 200 miles. And we go there every year. We always had a good team that would go. And we had hundreds and hundreds of kids. But instead of just teaching English, we would take the Bible. The main text would be this book right here. And they would read the Bible and they could talk English, talk about English. Amazingly how some of those students would uh, teach and would be able to speak English. One day, a mother came to me. She said, Pastor, I need to talk with you. 
And here her daughter, who was probably, I suppose, about 17, 18 years old, was pregnant. And the, doctor was make, the daughter was making plans to abort that baby. And the mother said, what can I do? Well, I, I didn't have opportunity to speak to the daughter, but I told the mother, here's what you tell her. You know, tell her, this is a real baby. This is a real person in your womb. And you tell her, we'll help you take care of this baby. Don't worry, but don't kill your baby. You will regret it the rest of your life. And so she went back home, and she told that to her daughter. A year or so later, I came back, and this same teacher met me as we were coming into the cafeteria. They call it the Stalovai over there. So, and she said, Pastor, there's a lady out in the hallway who wants to talk with you. So I go out there, and here is that daughter. And she's pushing a baby carriage. And she said, Pastor, look. And there in that baby carriage was one of the most beautiful babies I'd ever seen. I say, thank you, Lord that you intervened to protect that child. So that's kind of what it's like. But you know, you don't only, you, you try to intervene where, there, where you know there is so much guilt and pain. And you bring the gospel of forgiveness, the message that Jesus died for them, and he wants to take that sin in his body on the tree on the cross. But at the same time, and that's why we're here today, we're Lutherans for life, trying to prevent the killing of our babies. Because not only is a life lost, but look what it does. Look how it scars the heart, mind, and soul of a woman. And a man, because so often, it's men that force their women to have the abortion. So what can we do to prevent that? Yes, we have the message of the gospel message of forgiveness, but we have to try to prevent it. And one of the things that I discovered, and maybe you don't know this, but in all of these post-Soviet countries, there's always been a Lutheran church. In Russia, they were mostly German Lutherans who had come in from Germany to establish their farms and businesses, many along the Volga River, many in southern Ukraine, around uh, uh, the, the southern part of Ukraine, but wherever they were. But there were also a lot of Finns up in northeastern Russia which borders on Finland. And so uh, the seminaries, by and large, with some exceptions, still teach Bible. In other words, they're conservative. What do they conserve? They conserve Bible teaching, orthodox Bible theology. And so obviously there are exceptions. But as best I can tell, a vast majority of the pastors over there are what? Pro-life, pro-biblical life. They believe what the scripture teaches. The problem is, many times, and probably most times, pastors don't know how to take that theology, that understanding, and apply it to their people. And so many of them rarely, if ever, preach or teach about it. Some of the reasons given are, well, if I say anything about abortion, I know that maybe 15% of my women in the congregation have had abortions. So it'll make them feel bad. What's the problem with that reasoning? Pardon? They don't get forgiveness. Exactly. 
Yes, it might make them feel bad, but if you're a gospel pastor, what are you doing? Here is the guilt, the shame. I killed my own baby. But what does the pastor do? He points to what? The cross of Jesus, who said he came to bear, to take our sin. He who knew no sin became sin. Sin, what kind of sin? Well, all of them, but including the sin of killing my child. And so that's why we preach and we teach. And almost every time uh, I have preached about it, and I bring in the gospel, the message of the cross, along with it. As a matter of fact, I make it a kind of a rule of thumb that if I'm going to talk about abortion, I start out with the cross, and I end with the cross. And an invitation, you can bring that sin and give it to Jesus on the cross. I have come to understand that a lot of pastors are afraid to preach and teach about it because they are afraid maybe because it could be a controversial thing they might be rejected by their people you know I think we pastors have to understand that our value as a person comes not just from acceptance of other people or the applause or in support of other people. Where does our value come from? I like what my friend from Brazil, who's actually in, in Russia right now with two other guys from Brazil, speaking to a group of pastors, and he went through a trauma because he was crippled and he was rejected. And his mother had to sit him down one time when he came home broken and crying and explain, Oziel, your dad loves you, mom loves you, you are precious for us, you are important, and above all, you are precious in the sight of God. You can be rejected by everybody else, but you're precious in the sight of God. Now, Oziel, you have to either accept that or you're going to have to live the rest of your life depending on affirmation and, and whatever from other people. Oziel accepted that. And now he has kind of condensed it into a little, uh, a little theory. We are not who other people say we are, not who we think we are. We are what? Who God finish it out, says we are. Together, we are who God says we are. And what does he say we are? You were bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. Glorify God in the body of that child. Glorify God in the body of that mother or father. We are who God says we are. If anybody would like to look, I have a kind of a schematic here. It's an actual medical, medically accurate picture of what happens with an abortion. And I have here, and we can tell you where to order these things, a chart which helps, which actually charts the development of a child. Isn't it interesting? Starting down here with fertilization and uh, development, and then how do we get this thing? I guess it starts in the top. Yeah, and starts, goes here in the 10th week, 16th week, 20th week, and shows the development of the baby all the way to birth. And I, I use these quite frequently because it is such a good way to help people understand that this child is really a human person from the very beginning. 
And I believe it helps women to understand that because they're told by the abortion establishment, oh, this is just a what? Chunk of tissue. Here's another little book that shows the same thing. Fetal development, <clears throat> critical period, 23, 26 weeks, and all the way to full-term baby. These things are available. Here's another one, timeline of pregnancy. And if you would like to, uh, I've got a lot of these, come and grab one, tear them off of the tablet, and these are something good to give to your daughters or your granddaughters or whoever, somebody that's going to have a baby, and this shows them exactly the, the, uh, the, the, how a baby develops. And uh, it probably wouldn't even hurt us men to see how that happens. So anyway, uh, I want to close with a reading by Johann Gerhardt. Uh, they say there were three people, I guess you would call them luminaries, three of the most important theologians in the development of the Lutheran faith. The first one, of course, was Luther. Second one was whom? Martin Chemnitz, you got it. And the third one was Johann Gerhardt. And Johann Gerhardt was actually quite a sickly man, but a man who deeply loved the Lord and experienced. And here's what he says. Thanksgiving for life and birth. And I'm reading only a part of this devotional book, which incidentally was published by Concordia. And he, he prays, Omnipotent, eternal God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, I give you thanks. I praise you. I glorify you because your hands fashioned me and made every detail of what I am. You shaped me like clay in my mother's womb. You poured me out like milk and curdled me like cheese. You clothed me with skin and knit me together with bones and tendons. You gave me life and showed me mercy. In your providence, you watched over my spirit. Quoting largely from where? Job. Yeah, Job 10, 9 through 12. And toward the end of his prayer, he says, When I consider how many die in the womb before coming to the light of this life, I admire and praise your mercy all the more because you brought me alive safe and sound out of the confinement of the womb into the theater of this world. How many years passed in which I was nothing, but it pleased you to build this dwelling of my body, to bring it out of the deep darkness of my mother's womb. You have given me a rational soul and did not will that I be a stone or a snake. To you, my God, be honor and glory forever for this and your mercy. Let's pray. So, Lord God, we look at the travesty of abortion, which seems to be growing. The insensitivity, the denial of your truth, we look at that, Lord, and we cringe. And we have to say, please forgive us. But, Lord, particularly for those who are bent on child sacrifice, like the old worshipers of Baal and Canaan, the goddesses of Canaan, we say, have mercy. Bring to them, Lord, a crushing conscience that will cause them to seek, to grope for you and for the forgiveness that can come only through Jesus. And then, Lord, give us courage to speak your truth, even if it might mean rejection or if might, it might, might not be received. Help us to know and to speak your truth with love in the hope and power of Jesus, in the strength of your Holy Spirit, and in the truth of your Holy Word. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.